Dennis Prager here. Thanks for listening to the Daily Dennis Prager Podcast. To hear the entire three hours of my radio show, commercial-free, every single day, become a member of PragerTopia. You'll also get access to 15 years' worth of archives, as well as the daily show prep. Subscribe at PragerTopia.com. Hi, everybody, and a good Monday. I hope you had a good weekend. I do hope, actually. Can't say America had a good weekend, <laughs> but that's my line now for a couple of years. How are you, Dennis? Better than my country, but we're fighting for it. And this fight is not over. I just want you to understand that. They say, in fact, that among males, at least, the younger, the youngest generation is more conservative than in generations. Maybe they're awakening to the damage that the left does to everything that they cherish. I am juggling five different stories, and I want to talk about Newsom appointing a successor to the late Dianne Feinstein. I want to talk to you about the congressman who says that he meant to open the door, but he accidentally pulled the fire alarm. I, you have to admit, this is one of these errors that people make regularly. How often in your life have you triggered a fire law when you really meant to open a door, right? I, I, come on. Let, let, let's give the guy a little slack here. However, uh, uh, even my producer will be fascinated at the, the story that has mesmerized me uh, the most uh, uh, of today. And it comes from France. Now, do you know what I'm referring to? This works for you, for sure. Works. For, oh, yeah. You know, it would end my life as a, it would end a good chunk of Western civilization's life. Yeah. And let, let me. Uh, all right. Majority is majority. Is it young Europeans or young Frenchmen? So this story is out of Fox News. Shocking number of Europeans say you should only be able to fly four times in your life due to climate change. Is that round trip or just one way? So, oh, it's it's two round trips. That's what it means. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I, you're... Well, the interesting question is, does the trip, what if your trip makes a stop? Okay, right, then you've flown twice. Yes. That's true. How will people get to climate conferences? They'll Zoom. That's it, they'll Zoom. And the power for your computer or phone will come, of course, from wind turbines. A new poll shows that a shocking number of French citizens, see that's why I said French, support banning people from flying more than four times in their lives. Poll from research firm Consumer Science and Analytics Institute, CSA, found that 41% of citizens would support such a limit. That number rose to 59% support among 18 to 24-year-olds. The suggested limit proposed by engineer Jean-Marc Iancovici would apply to air travel for business or pleasure. Okay? You, uh, you, You must understand the irrationality, the utter dystopian aspect of all of this if this is true or if it's even nearly true the the production of frightened morons among young people in Europe is nightmarish it was young people who had the beyond growth conference I told I told you about that a gigantic conference uh, headed by a member of the European Union a, a, a an individual who's in the who's a d- 
delegate to the or not delegate. What do you what do you call them? In the European Union Senate, whatever. What what is there? It doesn't matter. He he's he represents one of the European countries, and the entire point of the conference was the idea of economic growth is not sustainable. We have to figure out how to decrease economies. This is so we we have produced a a generation in Europe and not a few here of frightening Frankensteins. That that's well Fra- what Frankenstein produced. Frankenstein was the doctor. Do they do, do these young people who allegedly voted this way in this poll, do they understand the repercussions of people not flying? I mean, basically four times in a lifetime is not flying. First of all, you realize it ends, effectively ends, the tourist industry, which for many countries is one of its two or three primary sources of income. In some cases, its primary source. It's really worth, uh, we'll just look up the amount spent on tourism. It, it, it's, it, it, the figure is staggering. Oh, not only is it, is of course, it economically extraordinarily helpful to societies, to the, the owner of a restaurant, to the, to the people who uh, drive taxis or Ubers in, these, in all of these countries, but it is such a valuable thing for humanity to have yourself or have people visit other countries, make new friends, or even if they don't make new friends, just visiting. It, a trillion dollars a year. A trillion dollars a year. And it's largely the the small guy who gets the money, the hotel owner, the restaurant owner. The Uber driver, the taxi driver, the guide, these are the people. That's in international tourism alone. That's international alone. All right, but theoretically, well, it would affect Americans because it, how exactly is a New Yorker going to uh, see the Golden Gate Bridge if he can't fly? How, what, what is it, a three-day trip on, on the train? If or two and a half days. I know my parents did it. God bless them in their 80s. That was a credit to them. They did it as a lark. I mean, they just thought it would be a cute thing to do. And it was. But how about, what if you have three kids and they live in three different cities and they each get married. Of course, the left doesn't really ache for you to get married, so that might not apply. But let's say they do get married, and you want to attend the wedding. You can, if you will be uh, only able to go to two of their weddings if they live far away. The poll surveyed 1,010 French residents over the age of 18. It found that support for air travel restrictions was far higher among younger age groups. While a majority opposed the four-flight lifetime maximums, 64% of the respondents said they would be willing to limit their air travel in the near or medium term to combat climate change. Yeah, you know, I'll tell you, see... This is all make-believe. It's The whole thing is make-believe. If there were no flights, you think the temperature on Earth would be affected? Climate activists across the globe have pushed for wide-ranging restrictions aimed at reducing carbon emissions from limiting car travel to banning plastic straws. In the United States, President Biden's administration has issued its own restrictions on gas-powered furnaces. 
Yeah, they're, they're, they're boiling the place. Meanwhile, every other week, I believe it is, or every other month, it, for the purposes of the argument, it's irrelevant. China opens a new coal refining or coal factory or coal mine. It is fascinating how China goes unscathed while the, 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 well, the, the West lacerates itself. The proposal, according to the agency, requires non-weatherized gas furnaces and those used in mobile homes to achieve a far higher level of efficiency than cheaper models on the market. The Greens are ruining the world, and they want to. Back in a moment. When running a business, your employees can create all kinds of interesting situations. Like getting complaints because someone on the team always smells horrible. You better talk to Bambi. With Bambi, get access to your own dedicated HR manager starting at just $99 per month. They're available by phone, email, and real-time chat, so onboarding and terminations run smoothly. Team members reach peak performance, and your business stays compliant with changing HR regulations. And with Bambi's HR Autopilot, You'll automate important HR practices like setting policies, training, and feedback. Schedule your free conversation today to see how much Bambi can take off your plate. Go to Bambi.com right now and type in Dennis Prager under podcast when you sign up. Spelled B-A-M-B-E-E dot com, Bambi.com, type in Dennis Prager. So they they want to limit, in at least in France, the young people. I'd like to. I hope they do a survey here. I think it's worth doing. I wonder what the answer would be for young people. Should people be banned from flying? Four times the left gravitates to the to greens, for many reasons. One of which is the desire to control people's lives. They really do loathe it when you do what you want. If you drive a car, it means you can go where you want and when you want, and they don't like that. They, they, want, they want you to follow the train schedule, the bus schedule. They, they hate the idea. That it, truly, you want to know what for most leftists, not liberals, not liberals, for, for most leftists, you want to know a nightmare scenario it is a nuclear family living in the suburbs with a picket fence and a two-car two car garage who go to church on Sunday, moreover. Oh, and who own guns. That is the, that is the worst nightmare. So my house. Your house would qualify? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Well, nuclear family alone. Remember, Black Lives Matter said that the nuclear family was was a white supremacist idea. They took that down when it was publicized. Diane Feinstein has passed away, and Governor Gavin Newsom, who embodies leftism, has chosen the successor, and he announced in advance he's going to. He's going to appoint a black woman. Th- this really gets people on the left excited. A black woman. That's right. There's never been... A, well, no, that's not true. There has been a black woman senator in New um, I'm working this through. There's, was Kamala Harris a senator? Yeah. Yeah. So should, we already had here in California a black woman. So yeah, they can't even say the first black woman. Ah, oh, <laughs> you're up on your firsts, my dear friends. This is not just any black woman. This is a black lesbian woman. So we do have a first. This is this is the stuff that 
causes the the secretion of pleasure hormones in people on the left. The first. Uh, on the black woman issue, I really do wonder, is the average black woman in America excited about this? Uh, it's a very open question. I don't know the answer, but it is it is precisely because I don't know the answer that I'm posing the question. Look, I, I had relatives, I remember this so well. Wonderful people. Liberals, not leftists, who voted for Gore Lieberman against Bush Cheney, and they at least one said to me, oh, look, Lee, Lieberman's a Jew. I, I, you know, to have a, the first Jewish vice president is so exciting. Now, I'm, I'm very involved in Jewish life and in Judaism. This is the 50th anniversary of the writing of my book, The Nine Questions People Ask About Judaism. It's still... I think, the best-selling introduction to Judaism in English. The State of Israel, the government, sent me as a young man to Soviet Union to help Soviet Jews. I mean, I, I care a great deal about Jews and Judaism. I didn't vote for Lieberman. It didn't, didn't even occur to me. And by the way, I, I knew him and I like him. He's a very fine human being. But I... I didn't like the Democrats' platform then. Today it's loathsome. Then it was just wrong, in my opinion. So I voted for Bush Cheney. So a lot of people apparently are moved by this first issue. It's the first of my group. However, it doesn't help your group. All the black mayors and all the black chiefs of police, how, has, how in, one, in one way, just one way, how has it helped black life in America? The left lives for political power because if you have power, you feel good about yourself and, as I said earlier, you get to control other people. And that is an erotic thrill on the part of the left. I can control other human beings is just so exciting. But in in terms of real benefits, what is the real benefit of having a member of your group in, in power. Did it help blacks that Barack Obama was president? Certainly it didn't help black-white relations. Black-white relations were better when Barack Obama entered office than when he left. Well, if you're a black lesbian, this must be some great day for you. There's now a black lesbian U.S. senator. Back in a moment. When the government used emergency edicts during COVID to restrict the gathering and worship of churches, three pastors facing the risk of imprisonment, unlimited fines, and their own churches being ripped apart, took a courageous stand and reopened their doors in the face of a world that chose to comply. The Essential Church is a feature-length documentary that explores the struggle between the church and government throughout history. This fascinating story uncovers those who've sacrificed their lives throughout history for what they truly believe in. We discover why the church is essential and how we prove that this stand remains true from a scientific, legal, and most importantly, biblical perspective. This is not your typical movie. It'll change your life. You need to see this movie with your friends and family. The Essential Church is streaming today exclusively at SalemNow.com. 
That's Essential Church, streaming at SalemNow.com. And I admire greatly and have great affection for Seth Leibson. He's a fellow at the Claremont Institute, and he hosts an extremely popular show in Phoenix on AM 980, The Patriot. 960, yes. You know who's 980? The Patriot, Philadelphia. No, no, they're 990. <laughs> Seth, I really blew it, didn't Ooh. I? You know, yeah, Seth, poor <laughs> Seth is sitting there going, I can't believe Prager okay. is ruining the introduction. <laughs> Dennis, you honor our airwaves and you honor me by having me. You're one of the three greatest teachers I've ever had. It's a delight to be with you. Thank you. I, I, thank you. It's a very beautiful thing uh, to, for you to say. So I'm sorry, but I want to know who the other two are. Uh, William Bennett, who you know well. Yeah. Had the privilege. Oh, you of worked with him for, for a while. Many, many years. That's right. And then the greatest teacher I've ever had, maybe the greatest teacher America's ever had, over in Claremont, passed away a few years ago. Harry Jaffa, uh, who I was privileged to study under, and uh, who helped kind of intellectually found the Claremont Institute you referred to. Well, I am in very elite company, uh, so it, it, that's very kind of you. But it, it goes chronologically then, Jaffa, uh, Bennett, Prager, right? Correct, Chronolo- correct. Chronologically. Every stage yes. of my life I have learned what I needed to learn from the people I needed right. to learn Well, from. of course, and right now, yeah. it's a credit to you, and I, I'm, not, I'm not here to blow smoke, uh, but, you know, the three of us and many other wonderful teachers uh, have been around and people have learned nothing. Uh, you, the recipient gets half the credit. I, I just need you. You should. I. You should know that, and you need to know that. That you had. You desired to get deeper, and you have. I mean, you're 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 a serious thinker. That's, All right. Anyway, that's kind of you. No, but, no. Well, it's we don't not, have teachers like you anymore, and that's uh-huh. that's the regret. You right. have the willingness to mentor people, and it's tremendous, Dennis. You're a great teacher. All right. Well, thank you very much. Seth yeah. Leibson has written a piece for the uh, was the Washington Times. Is that correct? Yes, sir. So it's it's about the drug crisis and the amount of death that it is dealing. So why don't you summarize just some of those frightening statistics that you open your article with. Sure. And it's a tale of two cities here, Dennis. Uh, One of tremendous problems and I think tremendous possibility. For anyone who's been involved in the drug issue, they know that 1979 was the worst year of regular drug use in this country. 14.1% of Americans were regularly using illegal and dangerous drugs. And the country rolled up its sleeves and went to work to do something about it. Uh, Every politician spoke about the issue. Athletes got in, professional athletics got into the issue. Hollywood got into the issue. And um, you remember those ads, the frying egg, this is your brain on drugs, tremendously impactful. And people say you can't do something about this. We actually did do something about this. And within 13 years, by 1992, we reduced regular drug use in this country by over 60%. And then we let up. And in that year, 1992, we were losing about 5,000 Americans a year to drug deaths, drug poisonings. They're not overdoses, they're poisonings. And today, we're losing 110,000 Americans a year. The country was smaller then. It was 245 million people. We're about 335 million now. So think about this to give you a sense of the enormity, Dennis. While the country grew by a third in population, drug poisoning deaths grew by 2,000%. I don't think people realize how serious this problem is. It's 300 people a day. It's the equivalent of two commercial airliners crashing over our skies every single day. And no no, no let up for Christmas and New Year's. No let up for Christmas or New Year's. A month ago, we commemorated 9-11. It's a 9-11 every 10 days. You've been to Washington, D.C. in the Vietnam Memorial. 58,000 names on that wall. Took 16 sad years to amass those names. We could build two of those walls a year. Now, 
this country is nowhere near on the right path of solving it. So a group of folks here and I decided to recreate what works, the stopstartshere.org. And we're going to do, this is your brain, we are doing, this is your brain on drug ads with modern messaging and in social media to start this aggressive prevention messaging again prevention works every time it's tried all right good fired. all right so you'll, you'll delineate the details yeah. what is the sure. name of the website the stop starts here the stop dot starts org. here dot org seth Liebson. yes sir folks the data and these are young people overwhelmingly i i know some believe it or not Back with Seth Liebson, who is uh, one of the stars of talk radio. He has a magnificent show. He is, you have to be entertaining because otherwise you don't have an audience. But of course, his primary appeal is his depth and his moral conviction. So he, he uh, did you do this alone? Are you doing this initiative with others? Thanks for asking, Dennis. Uh, about four or five of us got together here in town uh, about a year ago when we started really putting the meat on the bones of these statistics. We just came out of COVID and it dawned on us, this country, when it wants to put out a public health message, sure as hell knows how to do it, pardon my French. And we turned this country inside out and upside down with regard to COVID. And we were looking at the drugs and the drug issues and the drug deaths. And if you think about it, um, over the course of three and a half years of COVID, about 75,000 people under the age of 50 died, mostly with comorbidities. Well, last year alone, 80,000 people in one year under the age of 50 died from drug poisonings. 75% more children die from drug poisonings than did throughout COVID. We're misprioritized, so we decided to roll up our sleeves and put out a serious, unapologetic set of prevention messages that help this country understand what a true public health crisis is. Because most public health agencies in our government right now are promoting malfeasant messaging, like safe use. Like wait, 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 wait. I want, I want that. I read it in your article, and I hear it now. I mean, I don't trust any governmental institution i i'm i can i can cry saying this to you because this is new in my yeah. my long life Me too. but i don't trust any of them but this is it strikes me as a new low i i want you to back that up the primary sure. message of the american government with this annual slaughter of young people is use drugs safely Correct. There are billboards and messages in San Francisco from the San Francisco Department of Public Health that say if you're going to use, start slowly and use with a friend. And it's a picture of young people having a good time. That same message is throughout New York City. You will find this particularly interesting. The New York City Department of Public Health has a website on marijuana, and it talks about how to use marijuana safely. One of the bullet points is don't use it with tobacco. There is no safe use of tobacco. They never say there's no safe use of marijuana. It's tobacco that's their enemy. Dennis, the CDC itself, one last point, the CDC itself has a website that urges people to use fentanyl drugs, drug strips, uh, test strips, fentanyl test strips. This is, a, this is a mechanism, as they say on their website, to make sure that when you use cocaine, or other drugs, it's not laced with fentanyl. This is public policy malfeasance and the encouragement mm -hmm. of addiction and, and more death. And when We're on you, the wrong when, track. When, when do you apply that test? From the grave? Yeah, that's, that's what we're doing with the body count that's increasing. 110,000 Americans, as I said, died last year. We're on track to increase that this year. And the problem is, or at least maybe the the beauty of this is, is it doesn't have to be this way because we've solved this problem before. Prevention messaging does work. It's worked with forest fires. It's worked with cigarette smoking, God knows. It's worked with seatbelt use. It's worked with every, it's worked every time it's tried. And so our group, 
four or five others who joined me decided to put this organization together and do unapologetic, seri unapologetic serious prevention messaging throughout social media. And that's what we've been doing. Have you already begun some of these messages? Yeah, we started about uh, three weeks ago, Dennis, and the numbers are tremendous. We're getting hundreds of thousands of views throughout Instagram. Give an example Facebook. of one of the messages. We have several. One of them is the airplanes crashing, so people understand the enormity of the problem. But we've hired actors and a great video team to show children and young adults how this can happen and how this can happen to you. You may never know what's in that what you think is an innocent joint you may take at a party, or you may never know what's in that pill you think is Xanax or something else that's handed to you at a party. So we have dramatizations in 15 second spots, 30 second spots, minute long spots that we're trying to suffuse throughout social media. So what, stop what, starts why here. do you yeah. want people to go to your website? Well, we would love people to go to our website to see them and to spread those messages through their accounts if they can help us financially, if every one of your listeners gave us 10 bucks, we could for a year suffuse social media with serious prevention messaging. The kind of thing the government should be doing, but isn't. Uh, uh, don't start me on the, the priorities issue. Uh, from the beginning of my, of my career, I have said with all the dangers of cigarette smoking, we're going up the wrong, uh, we're fighting the wrong devil. And, and Isn't I, it a weird, you know. I'm not, no, go on. Go ahead. You go. I was just going to say, you know, it's an interesting thing throughout COVID, which was about protecting our lungs. And as COVID, as we noticed, isn't taking as many young lives as drug abuse is. Where's the concern for our brains? You're right about cigarettes. And we reduce smoking in this country with a serious public health prevention campaign to protect our lungs. What we're here saying is, don't you think our brains deserve as much protection as lungs and our lives as well? Well, God bless you. All right, give, uh, give everybody uh, the website again. The stop starts here dot org. Any help? Very much appreciated. Right. As much as you are appreciated, Dennis. Thank you. It's mutual. The, this the website. the stop starts here anyway that is also up at dennisprager.com folks the link thank you bless you this, thank bless you, you. Uh, you're, this is a very important endeavor all right everybody we'll return in a moment you're listening to the dennis prager show that was seth leibson great broadcaster at our sister station or my station in phoenix back in a moment the Dennis Prager Show. Mike Lindell has a passion to help you get the best sleep of your life. He didn't stop at the pillow. Mike also created the Giza Dream Bed Sheets. These sheets look and feel great, which means an even better night's sleep, which is crucial for overall health. Mike found the world's best cotton called Giza. It's ultra soft and breathable, but extremely durable. Mike's latest deal is the sale of the year for a limited time. You'll receive 50% off the Giza Dream Sheets, marking prices down as low as $29.98, depending on the size. Go to MyPillow.com, click on the radio podcasts square, and use the promo code Prager. There you'll find not only this amazing offer, but also deep discounts on all MyPillow products, including the MyPillow 2.0 mattress topper, MyPillow kitchen towel sets, and so much more. Call 800-761-6302 or go to MyPillow.com and use the promo code Prager. Hi everybody, welcome to the Dennis Prager Show. I hope you had a good weekend. Sean, did you have a good weekend? The the you have no idea how much mail I get. Did Sean have a good weekend? It, it's very moving. It truly. Well, this is a great day in California history. A black lesbian has been appointed senator from the state of California by Gavin Newsom. I'm telling you in cheek, not that I have anything zero against black lesbians. It's that the idea that this is a celebratory major moment if there's always this major moment a first not the first black woman and uh she is a died in the wool leftist and uh, by the way it's irrelevant from the perspective of 
ruining California. It is irrelevant whom Gavin Newsom would appoint, whoever he would have appointed, even, which would be impossible, a white, heterosexual Christian male. Even had he appointed that, that person, well, maybe not the Christian part, then uh, it, it, it's, it, it, well, look, he is. He's a white, heterosexual male. And he is destroying the state of California. He, he will go uh, to the next world, hopefully in many years. May he live in health. But when he is ever mentioned historically, the, uh, the odds are it will be as the governor who ruined the state of California more than any governor in the history of American life. Well, Pritzker, uh, you know, Pritzker, i, I got to say, there is a race for destroying one state. That Pritzker sleeps well at night proves something I have said often and written about, the uselessness of the conscience in most human beings. Pritzker is at peace with his conscience, and so is Newsom. Did you see the story? It was in Cal... I think it was California. I don't remember what city. Of a guy came in to, you know, one of these small shops uh, to rob it and poured, just took off the shelf, uh, liquid, uh, what do you call the stuff that, uh, butane, or I think I guess butane, poured it over the, uh, the guy and set him on fire. I, 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 I kept looking for a GoFundMe page. I want to send a serious amount of money for this man. And, The left's damage, and yet liberals vote left, is that is the moral crisis of our society. The left always destroys. That is all it does. It builds nothing good. It only destroys. Great art, great music, great teaching, great education, great schools, great medicine. All it is a destructive movement. That is all leftists know how to do is destroy. The nuclear family, happy children, male-female relations, black-white relations, that is all the left knows how to do. They, they do nothing positive. It is a completely dark force in society. And liberals who share none of their values or very almost none of them vote for them. This is a, uh, so it's irrelevant to those of us who live in California and to the country at large. It is irrelevant what race or sexual proclivity orientation the person that Newsom would appoint is. It's irrelevant. A leftist is a leftist, whether it's a black lesbian or a white uh, a male heterosexual. It doesn't matter. So who, I, I couldn't care less. Values are, are what matter, not these other factors. But Gavin Newsom thinks he's, he's done great. He's, he's, and he's certainly, presumably, going to get the black lesbian vote. But it doesn't matter. He gets vast numbers of white heterosexual votes, too. Especially among the well-educated. But that's a stupid term. I should never use well-educated. I need, I need another term for someone who has gone through graduate school or even just bachelor's. Well, they're not well-educated, so it's a bad idea. I'm well-educated. The... Um, the well indoctrinated. I think that's uh, that's a better term. I, it's not my perfect term, but it is a better term. <laughs> uh, I didn't I didn't mention this thing from last week's debate. This is from Breitbart. The New York Times labeled Republican presidential candidate Vivek Ramaswamy's comment on transgenderism during the debate as false. Huh. 
Ramaswamy, during the debate, said transgenderism, especially in kids, is a mental health disorder. We have to acknowledge the truth of that for what it is. Huh. A Times reporter wrote of the statement, this is false, but then added that transgender people experience the psychological distress. Psychological distress. (laughs) It's false. You think you're the other sex, you're 10 years old, and you think you're the other sex. It's not a mental disorder. Isn't gender dysphoria in the DSM-5? I think they're up to, uh, right, they're up to number five in the the manual for psychiatrists on, on, uh, on various disorders. See what DSM stands for. I mean, I know all about DSM, but I don't know what it stands for. It's not a mental disorder. It's completely normal to think that you are the other sex. Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Oh, that's the full term of mental disorders? Okay, so there it is. So gender dysphoria, that means where you, in fact, believe you are the other sex, is, is I, unless it's been removed, it has been, and I think it's still in there. It's not a mental disorder? If I said to you, seriously, if I said to you, you know, folks, for quite some time now, I have been realizing I'm a woman. Would your inclination, would it be to think, well, it's completely normal. There's nothing wrong with Dennis. He's just, he's been in denial of a reality. It's not a disorder. Ah, oh, so it is in there, but they have changed it to gender identity disorder. My dear friends, all of my life, prior to the term woke ever being invented, psychiatry has been in the forefront of ideology over science. And among my closest friends are psychiatrists. I mean, truly dear to my life, and a good psychiatrist is a blessing. But probably more than 50% of psychiatrists are fools. Psychologists, the same thing. I knew this as a kid when, I mean, it was very young, when all these psychiatrists, I think a thousand, what, what was the number who said Barry Goldwater was mentally ill? Yeah, wasn't it 900 or something? Take a look at the number. I mean, they, they should have all lost their license because you cannot diagnose a patient you have never seen. But it didn't matter to psychiatrists. They were leftists from the beginning. Somebody should write a book. I, probably there is one. Um, uh, the American Psychiatric Association reaction to Soviets putting dissidents in mental institutions. The hor- that horrible thing that they've done. We're not far John Strand is still in solitary confinement. Guy did nothing wrong in the Capitol on January 6th. There's a film of him in there. There's a video of him in there. I live in a country, thanks to the left, we have political prisoners for the first time in American history. And no liberal is bugged by it with the exception of Alan Dershowitz. So this is what uh, this is what the New York Times fact check said. Being transgender is not a mental health disorder. Many transgender people experience gender dysphoria or psychological distress as a result of the incongruence between their sex and their gender identity. Gender dysphoria is a diagnosis All right, back in a moment. So the New York Times labels Rawaswamy's statement that it's a mental disorder, gender dysphoria. False. 
the New York Times. It is truly sunk. What institution is not sunk? So this is the psychi- Where is this psychiatrist thing you sent me? Where is this from? Is it from the DSM? Where it's not. It's the description. Is it from a, a psychiatrist? Where did you get this? Human Life International. In in the latest version, the American Psychiatric Association replaced gender identity disorder with gender dysphoria. Huh? That's not true. They changed gender dysphoria. They, they didn't write it right. They, okay, let me make it clear. It is now gender dysphoria disorder as opposed to gender dysphoria. It did so in the hope that it would, quote, avoid stigma and ensure clinical care for individuals who see and feel themselves to be a different gender than the one they were born as. Okay, so why does that, can you tell me why that reduces the stigma? Why is gender identity disorder less stigmatizing than gender dysphoria? I, I don't know. Okay, but anyway, that's why the, in other words, it's, they still regard it as a disorder. That's, it's now, they didn't even have the word disorder before. It's worse now. It's better to have gender dysphoria than gender identity disorder. So the New York Times is false, not Rawaswamy. It's a complete lie on the part of the New York Times. They consider it it is a non-mental problem. Your your, uh, 15-year-old says he's a girl. He's completely normal. Or at least that is completely normal. It's not a disorder. He's doing fine. God, are they sick on the left. They're so sick. (sighs) People with GD, gender dysphoria, feel like they don't belong in their bodies. Okay, I'm... What is the... This, whatever you sent me, is is convoluted. I'm sorry. It's not... They claim that gender dysphoria is the new term and it's replaced gender identity disorder. They're, they're wrong. Okay, so I'm not going to read any more of this. I, I don't know. Uh, it, it is what it is. It doesn't matter. That, that, that is their reasoning and, and is convoluted. The point is that the new, this is the New York Times. This is what they are, that's what they are saying. Okay, well, if you, in case you missed the first hour, I just want to tell you that a majority of young people in France believe that human beings, all humans on Earth, should be limited to four air flights in their lifetime to, to counteract climate change. I'm telling you, the Greens' damage to society... The whole, the left is damages everything it touches. Everything. There is no exception. But the Greens within the left may end up the most destructive. As I often point out, Hitler was uh, primarily preoccupied with killing Jews. This, he, he was animated by Jew hatred more than any other thing. But he didn't win the election in 1932. The Nazis didn't primarily on anti-Semitism. They toned it down to get more votes. They won because of economic disorder. And uh, as a result of the Versailles Treaty, as a result of the Great Depression, and the staggering inflation in Germany. The Greens, this is, I never predict the future. I will now. The Greens will destroy economies Destroyed economies will will bring uh, tyranny to countries. Very few places today 
and certainly and historically, react to economic collapse with increased freedom. Bad, bad things will happen because of the Greens' destruction of the Western economy. Really, really bad things. Horrible things. It is another despicable aspect of the left, the Greens. I interviewed Robert Kennedy Jr. on my fireside chat. It's gotten a fair amount of attention. My weekly fireside chat for PragerU, the 308 episodes, they're all worth watching. They're all a half hour. They're quite moving. You should show them to uh, to your college-age kid or high school-age kid and, and watch yourself. Anyway, I had him. I almost never have guests, but I had him. He came to my home where I do it where I do the fireside chats. And I, I will, I, I have great admiration for him, great admiration. He is one courageous human being. But I, I was taken aback at his opposition to nuclear power. That was the, that, I'm very rarely surprised by a guest, but that surprised me. If you really believe that the world is coming to an end. That's what existential threat means because of climate change and opposed nuclear power. I'm sorry. Dennis Prager here. I, I told you truth is not a left-wing value. I tell you that. I mean, the New York Times exa- is a perfect example. They label false that Gender dysphoria or gender identity disorder is a mental illness. It's not, right? You think you are the other sex, you're fine. Mm -hmm. Well, all right. So there's uh, another example. Did you know that AOC has announced that she believes uh, the... Uh, Congressman Bowman. So last week, Congressman Bowman actually set off the alarm in the Capitol. And that delayed a vote. And he claims that he did it by accident. He thought it was the doorknob. Is that correct? Is that what he said? That it was the door opener. That by pressing down. Yeah, that by pressing down on it. On, on it. the door. Yes. So I wonder, this is really interesting. This is actually more of a moment than even the appointment of a lesbian black woman to the U.S. Senate. I, th- this, this is a first worth noting. Has anyone ever tried to open a door by pulling a fire alarm? Has that ever happened? This is a country of 330 million people. You, you understand that there are people who, uh, I, 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 the most bizarre things. But I, ha- I will admit, this might be a first. I thought it would open the door. The thing that said that was in red and that is not on the door on the wall, takes an effort to pull, and says, fire alarm. (laughs) The charmer is, the real thing, that that the guy is lying, is obvious to everyone except most people on the left, and that statement is accurate. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez has said she believes him. Did you see that? She believes him. Now, here is the question to be posed. Do you believe that she believes him? (laughs) This would be, I wouldn't even use it vindictively. I am just humanly curious if she would pass a lie detector test that I don't even give a hoot. 
about him, it's obvious he's lying. The, the, but I would like to have her put on a lie detector and ask, do you really believe that he thought that the fire alarm would open the door? You know, Sean has done a lot of wild things in his life. Really, it's, it's, it's basically a life devoted to outlandish acts. But he never did that. He has never mistaken a fire alarm for a door opener. That is somewhat like mistaken. It, ha, it is as bizarre, almost as bizarre. I will admit it's one degree less bizarre. But it is almost as bizarre as someone who would say, I thought that it was a can opener. I thought the fire alarm was a can opener, and that's why I pulled it. I wonder if any if anybody would do that on a subway train. You know, you can stop a subway train. At least you were able in the past uh, in New York City and presumably elsewhere. <laughs> And say, you know, I'm sorry. I, I I really thought it was a uh, something just to hold on to because all the straps were taken. Oh my God! I wonder if the New York Times believes him. Has the New York Times written an editorial on this thing? I I didn't think they would. Has the Wall Street Journal? I'm, I'm going to take a look up at it with regard to that. 1-8 Prager 776. You are listening to The Dennis Prager Show. Well, I'll let you know I was on. <laughs> let me do that again. See that? I do it again. No, there's no noise. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the show. I feel bad for my guest. He's probably wondering, is this what I signed up for? To go on this guy's show? Actually, I know my guest pretty well. I'm a, I think it's fair to say we're good friends. He's a very, very important Christian leader in the United States, Dr. Robert Jeffress, senior pastor at the 16,000-member First Baptist Church in Dallas and a Fox News contributor. He has a daily radio show, Pathway to Victory. It's on more than 1,000 stations. Wow. And we've been together uh, quite, a, quite a number of times, Pastor and I. He has a book out. As soon as I tell you the name, you will know why I'm having him on. The Ten Commandments. <laughs> It's actually called The Ten. I like that. It's a good way. How to live and love in a world that has lost its way. Pastor Jeffress Dennis Prager here. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me, Dennis. And yes, we are good friends. It's great to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. So, you know, I assume you know, but it doesn't matter. It's okay if you don't. But I, I believe that just this is the antidote to evil. If everybody lived by the Ten Commandments, my line is, we could defund the police. (laughs) Absolutely. And, you know, I feel a little bit inferior here. This is the third version of the Ten Commandments. The first one was given by Moses, and the second one by Dennis Prager. I know you've written on these. In fact, (laughs) I've quoted from you uh, in my book, The Ten. But I think you're exactly right. Uh, That subtitle, How to Live and Love in a World That's Lost Its Way, really describes what the culture in which we're living. And I think about Abraham Lincoln back in 1863 in the midst of the Civil War. He issued the first declaration for repentance and prayer, and he asked the question in that proclamation, what is it that is tearing our nation apart? And then he answered his own question by saying, we have forgotten God. And Dennis, I think 160 years later, that's true in America. 
the chaos you see politically, morally, spiritually in our country is a result of our thinking we can be good without God. We don't need God. But the fact is, he's our creator. He knows how we operate best. And these commit to these Ten Commandments were given not for God's benefit, but for our benefit. I want to stress something to my listeners. The, the pastor is a living example of why I always use, or regularly use, the term Judeo-Christian values. We have different theologies, obviously. Um, I'm a Jew. I'm a believing Jew. He's a believing Christian. But in terms of values, every word that Pastor Jeffress just said could have come from my mouth, this mm-hmm. Jew's mouth, this Christian's mouth, and that's that's a, it, it was so it was so perfectly stated. By the way, I did not know that Lincoln said that, and it, it is so illustrative of the difference in America then and today. If a president said that today, the New York Times would lampoon the man. That's exactly right. And yet, look at what we're going through as a nation right now. You know, I use one example in my book, The Ten. You know, there was an effort starting about 60 years ago by secularists to remove any expression of God from the public square. We can be good without God, they told us. And so 1962, prayers taken out, Bible reading, 1963. But the culminating decision was 1980, Stone versus Graham, which the Supreme Court said in a Kentucky school, you cannot only uh, not talk about the Ten Commandments, you can't even display them, because if they are displayed and have their desired effect, they might cause school children to read, venerate, and perhaps even obey the commandments, and this is not an acceptable objective under the establishment. Was that actually their wording? Yes, yes. Yes, I give it in my book, Stone versus Graham, 1980. Oh, my God. So we don't wait. We don't want it displayed lest they obey them. Yeah. You know what this reminds me? You will love this. This, I testified in in the U.S. Senate a few years ago uh, because PragerU videos had had been suppressed in in many ways by uh, by YouTube, uh, Google uh, owning YouTube. And so... uh, we, we were testifying at a Senate committee, we meaning myself, a couple of others, and a representative of Google. And uh, the, the senator asks, uh, Senator Cruz, asks the Google person, may, may I ask, why did you put Mr. Prager's PragerU video on the Ten Commandments on the restricted list? And he said with a straight face, because it mentions murder. Yeah. So that's exactly the Kentucky thing. Why would we want to teach kids not to murder? <laughs> and what's interesting, Dennis, the ultimate irony is that 17 years after that ruling, at Heath High School in Paducah, Kentucky, I remember a 14-year-old it. who had had a handgun uh, approached a group of students praying before school, opened fire on them, killing two, seriously wounding three, all in schools where 17 years earlier the Supreme Court said you cannot post the words, thou shalt not kill. You know, this is just what Hosea talked about in the Old Testament. God said to Hosea in chapter 4, verse 6, because you have forgotten me and my law, I will forget your children. And Dennis, I believe with all of my heart that uh, if we would start, uh, not finish, but just start displaying the Ten Commandments, we need to remind children there is a God. There is a God to whom we're all accountable. I'm not saying that's going to solve the problem of school shootings. There are other things we may need to do, but it all begins with an acknowledgement of our Creator and that He has given laws that govern our behavior. The book is The Ten Dr. Robert Jeffress, J-E-F-F-R-E-S-S. It is up at DennisPrager.com. It's only or order it any way you want, but you can see it uh, on my website. In light of what you just said, I'm curious what you think and, and feel totally free to say, you know, it's it's not one of the best ideas you ever heard. I'm fine with that. I, I But I, I really i am very serious about this, about putting up billboards on various highways around the country, something to the effect, 
Uh, yes, God does love you, but he also judges you. What do you think of that? Well, that is completely politically incorrect, but it is absolutely true. And, uh, you know, people, even whether it's the Old Testament view of God or the New Testament, you know, they, a lot of people think Jesus was this little wimpy rabbi who walked them around the countryside eating bird seed and saying nice things to people. But Jesus was very strict when it came to God's laws. And what God said about the Ten Commandments, he even uh, extended them further. You know, he said, you've heard it said, you shall not murder. I say to you, to hate somebody is tantamount to committing murder. But I think your idea is right. We need to know, even as uncomfortable as it makes us, that God is a God who judges us. He's always watching us. Uh, My ways are ever before the Lord, uh, Job said. And uh, we need to live with that constant knowledge that he is watching, evaluating, and eventually judging. You said that it'll make people uncomfortable. It's, I'm reminded of a saying, it's not mine, I wish it were, but I heard this many years ago, that the purpose of religion is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. Yeah, I think Van Tabner originated that, and it is so true. And Dennis, if there's one thing I want people to know about the Ten Commandments is God gave us these commandments not to repl- to repress us, but to bless us. When my daughter was little, we drove up to Pikes Peak, and uh, she was about five years old, and we got out, and there were no guardrails around the edge. And all of a sudden, she started running toward the edge, and I instinctively yelled out, stop. Now, why did I yell stop? I wasn't trying to rob her of some wonderful experience. I was trying to keep her from going over the cliff. And there's reason God says stop committing adultery, stop stealing, stop murdering. He's doing that for our benefit. He made us. He knows how we best operate. And the Ten Commandments are kind of God's operating manual for our lives. I mean, I'm quiet because it was so beautifully said. Anyway, folks, now you know why he is one of the most popular listened to Christians in America and indeed around the world. I'm, I'm delighted to recommend your book, The Ten How to Live and Love in a World that Has Lost Its Way, Dr. Robert Jeffress. It's up at DennisPrager.com. Pastor, it's great to be with you. Dennis, always look forward to being with you, and I'll see you soon, I hope. I hope so, too. I'll tell you, you know, I want to look at the bright side of the Congressman uh, Bowman's thing. Do you realize how many Americans would likely have pulled a a, uh, fire alarm thinking it was a doorknob and will now not do that as a result? Do you realize the service that this man has, has provided the United States of America? This is this is the stuff that we're supposed to believe. And as I said earlier, AOC has come out uh, in favor uh, of this. In case you missed, I noted that uh, the majority of young people in France, and I'd like to do the same thing in America, the same study, uh, have uh, are support the idea that people should in their be only allowed to take four airplane trips in the course of their lifetime. And I have no doubt that that sounds great to the Greens in America. I think that every that every environmentalist leader should be asked that question. Do you agree with the youth in France that people should be limited to four air flights in a lifetime? But they won't be asked this because... the. Who's going to ask them? The New York Times? The Washington Post? CNN? Who's going to ask them? I'd love to ask Al Gore. So, Al Gore, what do you think of the French youth's vote on behalf of limiting all airplane travel in your lifetime to four trips? Would you characterize it as a good idea? A ridiculous idea? No, he'll say it was well-intentioned, but we're not there yet. So do you hope we get there 
Is that your aim, that people fly only four times a year? I, I, could, I, could, I think I could give you all of his answers. Well, no, that's not realistic now. Okay, what is realistic? Would you like to limit airplane flying on the part of the, of the individual citizen per year? Not per lifetime, per year. Would you say four, not four flights in a, in a lifetime, four flights in a year? Are you, are you on board with that? Will you live by that? Would you live by that with your private plane? Then they'll say, well, no, what, what, well, we, we're looking forward to the day when airplanes are powered by electricity. That's what they're looking forward to. H- how will that work exactly? A battery can take a car a few hundred miles, right? Is that correct? You have one. No, even that's a few hundred is not accurate. I know. I'm trying to, I always try to, to be a conservative in my estimation. So it doesn't look like I'm posing a question because of my own views. Let's say 300 miles, 400 miles. So an airplane has to go 2,000, 3,000 miles just in the United States. Forget going abroad. Also the weight. And then the weight, right. The weight of the battery of the car yeah. is, in, is most of the weight of the car. You know, you saw the story about parking lots may be in, in jeopardy. Parking lots may be in jeopardy? Why? Because they're built for much lighter cars. Oh, the, oh right. They're built for lighter cars, so of all course. The cars in the yeah, no, no, that you would have to limit the number of cars. You're right. That's right. And then they'll put their parking lots out of business, which would be fine. They, they, as far as the Greens are concerned, all disruption of normal life is, is good. The empty, the affluent, the, I, you know, my equation, secularism, plus affluence equals boredom. It's exciting to be a leftist. You're overthrowing everything. Excitement is a more potent drug than heroin or any others that are taken. Excitement. People underestimate the importance of excitement or the desire for excitement in people's lives. Generally speaking, I have to, you know what, I have to address that. That Because generally speaking, it is true. I have to address that on the happiness hour. What do you do with the urge to be excited? Not an, it's an interesting question. So I obviously I start with myself. What do I do? Getting a, a a new piece of audio equipment is very exciting for me. I I have no desire to disrupt society. All of my excitement as such is personal. I want society to I want society to be unexciting. <laughs> That's the, it's the, the both the Jews and the Chinese, the among the oldest peoples on earth, have this wise saying. They have, as a curse, may you live in interesting times. Exactly, may you live in exciting times. It would be another way of putting it. Now, you, you want to make your own excitement. And have society be as calm and unexciting as possible. The left wants, because their lives are hollow in so many instances, they want society to be exciting. And what's more, what's more exciting, watching a building go up or watching one blown up? Hmm? Which is more exciting? What video would you more likely watch? 
then you understand the left. Blowing up is exciting. I'm Dennis Prager, and we have a new video up every week at the Prager U, our five-minute videos. If you only watch the five-minute videos, there's no doubt in my mind that in the great majority of cases, you would have learned more than at virtually any university. I'm not talking about STEM, science, technology, engineering, math. We don't teach that. But we do teach about life, about history, about theology, about psychology, about economics, and the latest video is why Columbus Day actually came about. The origins of Columbus Day. Needless to say, I learned a great deal. Why immigrants should love Columbus Day. That is its title. The woman presenting it, Alana Mastrangelo. Is it Mastrangelo or Gello? Uh, Mastrangelo. Mastrangelo. Okay, good. I'm glad. I, I, I really am stickler on getting people's names right. Alana Mastrangelo. She's a reporter for Breitbart News. Breitbart News is awesome. I don't use the term often. It's overused. Your, you know, your waiter takes your order and, and says, awesome. I don't know why a hamburger is awesome. Uh, an order for a hamburger. But uh, anyway, Breitbart is. So I want you to hear the beginning of her video that's up this week, Why Immigrants Should Love Columbus Day. You don't have that ready? Okay, that's not up, Alan, so. All right, doesn't matter. We have the woman herself. How on God's earth did you even know about this? How many people know about this? I didn't know anything until I, I read your script and then saw the video. How do you know so much about this? Well, I'm of Italian descent myself. My father's an immigrant and my mother's parents are immigrants from Italy. So I grew up in an Italian household and Columbus Day celebrations have always been, you know, a a fun time when we get to, you know, come out and celebrate being Italian, living in America. And then in the recent years, you know, with the woke pushing back on everything, on, you know, attacking Columbus Day. And, you know, it seemed like it was an attack on us. So I just started to look into it, you know, what is the true history of Columbus Day? And it turns out that the the true history of Columbus Day is, it's ironic that the left is attacking it because Columbus Day was established to make Americans more accepting of immigrants, specifically Italian immigrants. So it's just, it's ironic that uh, that the left has taken this, this route. Well, under ironic uh, is a picture of the left. I mean, the left claims to be feminist, and yet they are the greatest destroyers of women's sports in American history. So irony is is their trademark. So this history is, is fascinating. So let's begin with why is it, why it was established which I did not know, by the way, the uh, level of anti-Italian uh, bigotry. Uh, maybe start with that. Uh, this is a sad chapter in American life, but I we, we need to know sad chapters too. So briefly tell us about that. Yeah, so back in the uh, early 18, or no, late 1800s, early 1900s, you know, there was a, there was a mass migration of Italian immigrants. And the sentiment was very was very low they uh, we even had the new york times writing um writing articles about italian immigrants calling them low ignorant class of people coming to our shores uh they would refer to italians as dagos which is an ethnic slur to um to talk about italians um and and they would even write approvingly of a lynching of italian citizen or italian americans so with the sentiment being at an all-time low, you you had also um, a mass lynching, one of the worst uh, acts of racial violence in American history. You had a mass lynching of 11 Italian Americans in New Orleans over hearsay. It was, there wasn't even anyone guilty in a trial, but there was a mob violence that broke out, and and there was a mass lynching of Italians. So so Italians, when they first got here, they they weren't 
you didn't have it easy. You know, they had, by they the way, I just want to make clear ly- lynching is not the literal hanging. They were, they were murdered, uh, but it wasn't, they weren't hanged from trees. I just, just want to make that clear. Oh, okay. Yes. I think they were that incident in 18, I think it was 1891. I think they were murdered first and then right, but, hanged later, displayed later. Uh-huh. There was just a crazy mob violence that broke out. Um, All right. But, hold it there. Th- th- this is, this is, again, I think this is news to people and how, ha- how Columbus Day was an antidote to bigotry. You should know about that. Dennis Prager here. Thanks for listening to the Daily Dennis Prager Podcast. To hear the entire three hours of my radio show, commercial-free, every single day, become a member of PragerTopia. You'll also get access to 15 years' worth of archives, as well as the daily show prep. Subscribe at PragerTopia.com.